Katrine Kro Andersen. I'm the Dean of Research at the Technical University of Denmark, and I'd like to welcome you all to this HC Ørsted lecture today by our guest visitor from University of Berkeley, Stephen Louis. We're most most happy to have you visiting today at, at DTU. And I would also like to, uh, to welcome all our visitors, our guests, our students, colleagues, everybody who is here today for this Ørsted lecture. Ørsted lectures have been taking place at DCU for about 20 years and they are an opportunity for us to, to invite you all to uh, talks by some of the world's most prominent scientists on fascinating and inspiring uh, themes of their research and make us all aware of what's happening out there and inspire hopefully some of you students but also some of you, uh, you as scientists as, uh, who work at DTU and get the, a look at what is happening other places than, than our university and hopefully also to build up or strengthen collaborations uh, for the future. These uh, lectures are called H.G. Ørsted Lectures, and as yes, you probably know, H.G. Ørsted was the founder of our university in 1829, and in 2020 we're actually going to celebrate that, that uh, it's the 200 years anniversary of his uh, in invention or his, uh, his, uh, of, of his discovery of electromagnetism, and for that reason we're also building up to, to this event in, in 2020, uh, and we'll have further focus on that in, in upcoming Ørsted Lectures. In general, we have uh, two Ørsted lectures per year. This year, we actually have three. So the next one will be on the 4th of December, and you might already want to, to uh, put that or highlight that, that in your agenda, so you're ready to be here again for the next lecture. But uh, I think um, with that, I will pass on the word to uh, Carsten Professor Karl Wiedel Jakobsen from DCU Physics, who will give you a further introduction to uh, Stephen Louis and this is a talk today, which is called The Fascinating Quantum World of Two-Dimensional Materials. And I'm looking forward to learn more about that. Please, Carsten. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Louis. It's a great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Professor Stephen Louis as today's uh, Oster lecturer. Steve Louis received his PhD in physics from the University of California at Berkeley in 1976. After that, he worked at the IBM Watson Research Center, Bell Labs, and the University of Penn. And then he returned to UC Berkeley in 1980, where he is now professor of physics and he is concurrently a faculty senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, Steve Lewis is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has received many prizes and awards, and to mention some of them, he is recipient of the APS Anisar Raman Prize for Computational Physics, the APS Davison German Prize in Surface Physics, the Materials Theory Award of the Materials Research Society and also the Foresight Institute Richard Feynman Prize in Nanotechnology. He's also a Jubilee Professor of Chalmers University here nearby. Stephen Lewis' research lies within the field of theoretical condensed matter physics and nanoscience. To put his work in a bit of historical context, then the basic theory behind his work, namely quantum mechanics, was born about 100 years ago. And in the beginning, the focus of the new theory was very much on atoms and uh, molecules, but during the last century, quantum mechanics gradually made its way into the understanding of condensed matter systems and materials. Much of the basic understanding of how electrons behave and how they control material properties, including, for example, superconductivity, was developed around 1960 or in the 1960s. Uh, I can mention here, as we're in the Nordic countries, that some of the seminal contributions to this development were actually made by several Swedes, including Lars Hedin, Stieg Lundqvist, and Bengt Lundqvist. And their work led to the rather peculiar term called the Swedish electron gas. Okay. As if. The last uh, couple of decades has seen uh, two dramatic changes in condensed matter and material physics. Probably more, but I'll just mention two. The first one is the ability to experimentally control and investigate matter at the nanoscale, leading to the new field of nanotechnology. The other change, and this is where Steve Lewis' work also comes 
allowed into play is the incredible increase in computational power, which means that today quantum mechanics is not only a beautiful theory, but also a precise tool to understand and predict the properties of real materials and nanostructures. Steve Louis has been one of the leaders in developing computational methods to calculate the properties of real materials and nanostructures directly based on quantum mechanics. He has, if you like, taken the Swedish electron gas from the 60s and made it into a theory and a computational approach applicable to real materials. His many contributions include the development of new computational methods to calculate electronic excitations in semiconductors at surfaces and in nanostructures. His main interest the last decade has been on low dimensional systems where he has pioneered the quantitative understanding of graphene and other two dimensional materials. Uh, if you like some numbers, then his impact has been tremendous. He has more than 60,000 citations and his age index is well above 100. So with these words, it's a great pleasure to give the uh, words further on to Steve Louis so that he can enlighten us, us in this uh, Erster lecture on two-dimensional materials. So, please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Jacobson and Professor Anderson for the kind uh, introduction. I'm very honored and pleased to uh, give today's uh, lecture. Of course, I would like to thank the selection committee for giving me uh, this honor also. So what I would like to do, I actually I was very really humbled uh, by the list of former speakers in this uh, series of lectures. So what I would like to do today is basically tell you, share with you some of the recent work that we have done in the area of uh, uh, atomically thin two-dimensional uh, materials. So as you all know, uh, materials has played such an important uh, role in the development of humankind that uh, we use them to label uh, the major eras of uh, human history. Uh, so this is a, a figure that uh, I stole from the website of the materials department of uh, Loughborough. Uh, university in UK. So it showed you that uh, starting from the Stone Age, millions of years ago, all the way uh, through the Industrial Revolution, Machine Age, to the present date. Now, of course, uh, Professor Hans Christian Ostedt is was a giant in science and also in technology. And his contributions are many, uh, including, as mentioned, the discovery of that electric currents can generate magnetic fields, and also the discovery isolation of aluminum. And his contribution, of, uh, of course, uh, certainly uh, were uh, essential elements for uh, the Industrial Revolution and Machine Age. Nowadays, we are talking about plastic age, silicon age, maybe nanomaterial ages. Now, uh, in terms of nanomaterials, when we talk about um, what is a man, uh, nanomaterial, basically we are talking about material with structure that is at least nanoscale in dimension along one of the directions. So you have uh, zero-dimensional nanomaterials like clusters, uh, nanoparticles, quantum dots. Uh, 1D materials like carbon nanotubes, nanowires, nanorods. And then you have the 2D uh, materials, including uh, semiconductor quantum wells, uh, graphene, and uh, so-called atomically thin uh, 2D uh, materials. So this is going to be the topic I will focus on uh, 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 in today's lecture. So atomically thin 2D material has been a very exciting development in the last decade or so, and there are many new science and possible application coming out of this uh, field. And the 
uh, most well-known example among this class of material is graphene, which is basically a single layer of graphite. Uh, of course, there are many layer materials in nature, and one could also, and one has, uh, uh, many uh, experimental has done uh, exactly that, taking uh, such a material and make uh, atomically thin uh, one or two layers. So here I have uh, a, a number of examples. This class of so-called transition metal dichrocarginized systems, which are Unlike graphene, uh, they can be semiconductors, metals, or even superconductors. So uh, that greatly in, in, enlarge the property of uh, uh, 2D material going beyond uh, graphene. And you have the uh, big gap insulators like boron nitride. Uh, iron selenide is another class of layer material which is superconducting in the bulk, but if you make a single layer of this and put it on top of a substrate like uh, uh, strontium titanate, then you could increase its transition temperature by order magnitude from about uh, 10 degrees to 100 degrees. And you could also have uh, uh, 2D material that becomes a, a, a ferromagnet, uh, even at uh, low dimension. So I'm going to talk about some of this uh, system uh, today. And of course, there are many uh, researchers working in this er area now. As I mentioned, there are much excitement, and many of the advances in the field, in fact, uh, are made in this uh, university uh, DTU. So, uh, in addition to look at individual layer materials, because these are materials that weakly interacting uh, perpendicular to the direction of the plane, one could imagine making uh, a combination of this material by just stacking them up and get you uh, uh, materials with very, very different properties. Uh, so that's the dream uh, in this field. In fact, uh, there have been uh, some uh, example of this kind of fabrication in several laboratories. So in this talk, I will mainly talk about the transport and the optical property of uh, 2D systems. Uh, because the restricted geometry, the property of, the, the, of this kind of material are greatly influenced by quantum confinement, enhanced electron-electron interaction, and redimensionality, reduced dimensionality and symmetry effects. And this kind of effect uh, often lead to uh, novel properties and phenomena that usually do not exist in the bulk. And they are also often uh, useful in applications. Uh, in particular, uh, because uh, you're talking about atomically thin uh, systems, their property can be actually tuned and controlled by uh, gating and, and environmental screening, as you will see uh, later. So this is basically the outline of my talk. I'm going to begin with some basics uh, regarding to solid state physics, because I'm told that this is quite a wide audience. Uh, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the photophysics of quasi two dimensional crystal, uh, and then move on to uh, talk about uh, uh, graphene nano ribbons, which turn out to be very interesting uh, topological uh, electronic materials, and discuss. Uh, a new set of selection rules for optical transition in 2D materials, then talk about magnetism in 2D, how we could control it, and then finally, if I have time, which I might not have, is to talk about some weird electron transport into the uh, uh, direct fermion system in the presence of disorder. So let me begin with the very, some very basic uh, physics regarding to the solid state crystals. I'm apologizing to the experts in the audience. This is basically uh, what you learn in first year solid state physics. Uh, 
The first thing I would like to mention, which I will use uh, very often, is so-called Bloch's theorem. Uh, uh, Felix Bloch uh, proved, uh, after the normal quantum mechanics, that for a periodic crystal, because of the crystalline periodicity, the electronic states in a crystal actually extend the propagating states you could uh, write a wave function in this form where you have a wave vector k and u is a periodic function which look exactly the same in every unit cell. And then the, the energy of the electronic state can be labeled by a quantum number uh, k, the wave vector, and some other quantum number n. So you end up with having a band structure look like that, uh, e versus k. Another thing that uh, one could deduce uh, from crystalline symmetry is that uh, the distinct physical states can exist only in a finite region of K-space, and that's called uh, the Brion zone, which I, I will make use of later. And the Brion zone, in fact, is a compact geometric uh, manifold. So in one dimension, it's a, it's a circle, in two dimension is a, a torus, and then in three dimension is just a higher dimensional uh, torus. Another challenge in understanding uh, a condensed matter uh, uh, system is that you really have a system of uh, many interacting uh, electrons. So for many properties, one needs to use few theoretical many-body techniques which Professor uh, Jack Hassan has mentioned regarding to uh, the Swedish uh, electronic gas. Uh, and it turns out nowadays, for moderately correlated uh, electron system, one could actually solve this problem numerically from first principle using uh, many body perturbation theory. So let me now turn to uh, quasi 2D uh, system. They're going to be, uh, we're going to look at the spectroscopic uh, and transport property of uh, such uh, systems. So two things I would like to emphasize or remind you from the beginning. One is that you do have enhanced uh, Coulomb interaction in such system because you're in restricted dimension. The electrons cannot avoid each other as much. And the second thing which is less well known is that you could you can have very strange and strong spatial uh, screening dependent uh, between interacting particles in such a system. And I will illustrate this through a, this cartoon here. Suppose this is your two-dimensional crystal. You have uh, two charges, I'd say an electron and a hole here, and they're interacting through the Coulomb interaction. Now, when the two particles are very close to each other, then the particles in between cannot really screen the Coulomb interaction. So there's very weak screening. But when the two particles are further away, then the other electron could screen the Coulomb interaction. So you would expect the, the screening to increase as a function of, of distance. And in the three-dimensional uh, bulk material, that would quickly saturate to a constant uh, uh, screening for, say, a semiconductor. But in this kind of 2D system, you see that the Coulomb line actually go outside of the sample because we live in a three-dimensional world. So we see that those, those Coulomb lines are not screening, not screen, and therefore uh, the screening actually become weaker as you um, move the particles uh, further apart. So effectively, if you uh, look at uh, the dielectric function of such a system as a function of distance, for a bulk semiconductor, it start, would start at one and then quickly go to a, a constant and remain there. Uh, and that uh, distance would be in order of field bonding. But for a 2D material, it would uh, start at one, peak at some value at a distance roughly correspond to the thickness of the material, and then it would go back to one again. Okay, that's going to be important in understanding some of the properties. 
And also, if this material cannot be in isolation, it has to be in some environment. So for example, you put it on top of a substrate, you see that the fuel line now go into the substrate. That means substrate screening or environmental screening are very important in understanding the property of 2D materials. So now let me turn to um, uh, the photophysics of uh, atomically thin uh, 2D crystals going beyond graphene. I will use molybdenum disulfide as an example. Uh, this is uh, one of the so-called transition metal dicarcogenide uh, 2D materials. Uh, within, uh, for this example, it's a, the material is a semiconductor. It has very strong light matter interaction. So that means the, the, the electron and hole you created will uh, have strong interaction and lead to uh, some very interesting uh, excitonic physics. For this system, there are also very strong spin orbit coupling because you involve uh, heavy elements. And that uh, give rise to the following facts. This is the Brion zone of uh, Marley disulfide, and the low energy excitations are actually at the corner of the Brion zone. Uh, because of spin orbit interaction, the, sp the, the spin texture of electrons in this part of the Brion zone is very different from that part. And it turns out that you could excite the carriers uh, using one circular polarized light for one volley, or we call that a volley, compared to the other volley. So this is very interesting. Now you have a system that you could independently uh, manipulate the char, spin, and the volley degree of freedom for your semiconductor. And that got really get people excited, and people are actually now thinking in terms of using this volley degree of freedom to do uh, application, so-called uh, volleytronics. So here's some uh, 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 calculation we had done, uh, uh, looking at the optical uh, spectrum of a monolayer of Mali disulfide. Uh, here is the absorbance of a monolayer in absolute uh, uh, percentage as a function of photon energy. Uh, the band structure of Mali disulfide is given by this diagram. It has a, a direct band gap at the corner of the Brion zone at this so called K pawn. The top of the valence band is split by spin orbit coupling. Uh, so you look at the optical transition from the standard textbook point of view, you would have transition from this state, this band, to that band. We call the A transition and then the B transition. Now let's come back to the absorption as a function of energy. If I neglect many body effects and neglect electron hole interaction, just consider interband transition uh, like you learn in the uh, textbooks, what you would find is uh, absorption looking something like that, given by this dashed curve. But if you include electron hole interaction, then you will get this blue uh, green curve, which is dramatically different from that in the independent particle picture. You get a series of lines here that correspond strongly bond electron hole pairs. And um, uh, so for every uh, interband transition, you actually get a series of excitonic states that can be accessed by photons. So this is the A series, and then you have the B series here. You look at the, the binding energy of this state, uh, the, ex uh, the, the difference between this one and that point, you will see that the binding energy of the exciton is about 0.7 electron volts, which is our order of magnitude bigger than that of a bulk semiconductor of the same uh, band gap. Um, another thing is that the oscillator strength for the absorption is very large. It basically, it robbed, it because of many body interaction, it robs the oscillator strains from high frequency all the way to all the low frequency excitations. So how does it compare to experiment? This is some uh, measurement done by Tony Hines group uh, at Columbia uh, when he was there. Uh, so you see that the two peaks here correspond very well with this 
uh, two peaks. These are uh, ab initio calculations, so they're basically no adjustable parameters, and, and uh, what you get is what you get. Uh, and you could say now that there's still some discrepancy here, even though there's a large absorption uh, background at a higher frequency. It turned out that we, we did neglect uh, one thing in the calculation, which is the electron phonon interactions, how the electron interacts with the vibrational mode of the system. And when you include that, then you have this green curve, which now is in even better agreement with experiment. And what I would like to emphasize to you is that because you in, 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 in this uh, uh, two dimension, you actually have very strong absorption per, uh, uh, <coughs> in the system. Uh, for example, you look at the absorption per half a nanometer uh, of the material at uh, 2 EV around this range. Monolayer, monodisulfide is actually 20%. Uh, by layer graphene would give you roughly around 5%, and the silicon thin film of that thickness would only give you uh, 0.05, uh, 0.02%. Uh, percent. So it's this very strong electron hole interaction that gives you this very large absorption. And, and even this uh, predicted C peak that, uh, that, that we make have been recently uh, seen in experiment. Now, let me quickly uh, tell you a bit about some of the individual ex excitonic states. These are uh, the, what I call the A series of excitonic states. Some of them are bright. That's what you see in absorption, absorbance uh, spectrum. And some of them are dark. Uh, you could look at the wave function of the exciton in uh, K space. Uh, and K space and, and real space is related through a, a equation like that. And what you find is the wave function in K space is very, very tiny. That means in real space is very extended. So even though that the exciton binding energy is very large, these are what we call Vanier excitons. They actually uh, are quite extended in real space in order of a few nanometers. Uh, if you want to try to understand this kind of exciton from a hydrogenic-like model, because you have one electron, one hole circling around each other, and you do it by a kind of effective mass model, yeah, then what you get is spectrum look like that. And what you see compared to the initial calculation is that there's significant difference in the excited states. And in fact, the higher angular momentum state is lower in energy than low en uh, the low angular momentum states, which is something that counterintuitive. And this actually comes from uh, this uh, spatial dependent on screening that I uh, mentioned earlier. That is, uh, the 1S state has a tighter radius, so it sees a biggest, the big peak here, and the interaction is screen. But the higher uh, energy states, in fact, is more uh, extended, so the interaction ceases less screening. So that's why all those states are pulled down, pulled down in energy. And the 2P is more extended than the 2S, and that gives you why the 2P state is lower than the 2S state. Uh, so this kind of physics have been actually uh, seen in experiments using two photon uh, spectroscopy uh, experiments. Uh, let me say a few things about substrate screening. Uh, as I mentioned, you expect that to be important. Indeed, it is important. Uh, this, uh, as an illustration, what I'm uh, showing you here is a monolayer of monodiselenide on top of a, um, a, a graphene layer as a substrate. If I have a point charge in such a uh, 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 Marley diselenide uh, monolayer that pond charge because of the presence of the substrate will induce some screening charge and this is the screening charge that completely due to the fact that you have a substrate over there. So you see it's quite large and quite uh, complicated and you have to include this kind of uh, screening uh, in uh, 
uh, your understanding of the property of material. So screening in general is non-local and it's actually frequency dependent. Um, so the consequence of this uh, is that uh, depending on what substrate you put your material on, uh, you could change the band gap of that material by more than 50% in some cases, and you could change the exciton binding energy by a factor of two or more. So when somebody tells you the property of a, of a 2D material, you should really ask, you know, what environment this material is in. Okay, another thing that we, we discover regarding to 2D materials is the, center ma uh, the, the dispersion relations of the excitons in 2D can be very different from that of 3D. Uh, for example, uh, so far we've been uh, talking about uh, Q, the center mass momentum of the exciton, very small because that's how you generate it with light. But finite uh, momentum, uh, center mass momentum excitons do exist, and you could uh, measure using different experiments, and they are important in a number of uh, physical processes. Now, for a bulk semiconductor, you would expect the dispersion relation, that is the energy as a function of the center mass momentum of the exciton, to be of uh, this form. Uh, so, uh, the momentum squared divided by some mass, the mass will be something like the electron mass plus the whole mass. However, this is not true in two dimension for some of the excitons. What we find is that indeed, um, because of, uh, again, many body interaction, because there's really not a hole interacting with electron, the, the excited electron is actually interacting with all the other unexcited electrons in your crystal. And that leads to the interaction to have a, uh, what we call exchange turn. This exchange turn, in fact, can modify the uh, exciton uh, dispersion relation by a huge amount. So here is a case of a Mali disulfide. I'm just plotting the exciton uh, energy as a function of the center mass momentum. Uh, it's quite complicated. I just want you to focus on this one branch. This branch actually have a linear dispersion relation. So it behaves like a massless particle and with a velocity that's about a 1,000th time of the velocity of light. And this feature turned out to be uh, true for all atomically thin 2D semiconductor. It's basically come from this exchange interaction that uh, naturally come out from uh, the many body interaction in the real material. Uh, now let me turn to uh, graphene nanoribbons. Uh, graphene, uh, is a single layer of graphite. Suppose I take graphene and cut a ribbon out with a diameter about a nanometer, then we call that a nano uh, ribbon. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, a width of about one nanometer. And uh, of course, you could cut it out in different ways. Uh, uh, depending on the way you cut it, you could have different uh, edge shapes. This is called zigzag. Uh, nano ribbon and this is called armchair uh, nano ribbon and you can make uh, shapes in between and uh, about 10 years ago we find that this kind of nano ribbon in fact uh, or semiconductor they can have very uh, 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 interesting electronic and magnetic properties. At the time we uh, studied this kind of nano ribbon, it's basically an idealized model from Madeira's point of view. But now there are actually tremendous renewed interest in the nano ribbons because experimentalists now could actually make this kind of nano ribbons using a bottom up uh, synthesis uh, 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 procedure. And one could actually now make perfect armchair or zigzag graphene nano ribbon with a width of around one to three nanometer and length that uh, go up to a, uh, several hundred uh, nanometers. And this are synthesized through a, uh, a molecular precursor method, either on a surface or in solution. 
So the procedure is actually quite simple. First, uh, uh, pioneered by Roman Faso. Uh, what you do, you take some uh, uh, precursor molecule, you draw on the surface, you heat it up, and then they just polymerize and form an almost perfect uh, uh, armchair uh, ribbon here. And here, what we call is a seven uh, armchair ribbon because there are seven rows of carbon atoms to make up the width of the ribbon. If you start with a, uh, a separate molecule, uh, a different molecule, you would end up with a different uh, width uh, ribbon. And in fact, if you start with a precursor molecule with some dopant in it, then you will form a periodically doped uh, uh, graphene nano ribbon. And one could also form ribbons of this wear shape that have been done. And also, by combining these two molecules, you could form heterojunction of uh, uh, nano uh, ribbons. So, what we have done uh, lately is try to examine the topological uh, property of this system and how, see how it could change uh, their properties. So, now before I come back to the ribbons, let me uh, tell you a bit about. Uh, remind you a bit about topology. Topology is basically a study of global property of an object that's preserved under uh, continuous deformation and that's characterized by uh, some invariants. So for example, a ball is different from a donut and you cannot transform a ball into the donut. And so in for a two-dimensional surface, this is usually characterized by uh, 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 an integer. Uh, so topology is uh, a property, a global property. And uh, on the other hand, geometric properties are, uh, such as curvature are local uh, properties. Uh, but the integral over uh, local properties uh, often may characterize the global topology of an object. So a famous example would be uh, the, 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 the gauss banach uh, theorem applied to a uh, 2D surface. If you integrate over the Gaussian curvature of a compact 2D surface, it will be always equal to 4 pi times 1 minus an uh, integer. So for a sphere, uh, that integer would be 0. For a donut, it would be uh, one. And now if you look at the electronic structure of a material, it turns out that uh, the topology of the electronic state in the Brion zone, which is a complex object that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the role of local geometry is actually taken by a quantity we call the Berry connection is defined to this relation where u is just the periodic part of the blocks uh, or wave function. Uh, so, in fact, the study of the non triple topology of the block, block bands uh, in the last couple of decades has led to a much deeper understanding of a number of physical phenomena, uh, including having protected boundary states, the integer quantum Hall effect, and new uh, phases of ma matter. In fact, uh, the Nobel Prize two years ago was given uh, on this uh, topic. What we have uh, found is through looking at this, the, the topological phases of 1D crystal, it turns out that uh, the, the topological phases of 1D crystals can be characterized by looking at the various phase uh, integrating across the Brion zone. And the Brion zone for a 1D system or a ribbon is just a circle. So it can be characterized by a number. That number is either 0 or 1. We call that number Z2. And what we have discovered is that all graphene uh, uh, nano ribbons with some spatial symmetry uh, holds symmetry protected uh, topological phases. And that, because of the bulk boundary correspondence, in, uh, in, in the, in, which is well developed in 
the, the field of topological phases of uh, uh, materials uh, will lead to uh, very interesting end and boundary states between uh, segments with distinct uh, topologies. So our main finding for this graphene nanoribbons uh, are the following, uh, that they are large gap uh, uh, materials with non-trivial topological phases. Uh, those fa uh, topology phase, topological phases are protected by uh, symmetry. Uh, and another very interesting thing about uh, the graphene nanoribbons that this topological invariant can in fact change with uh, different terminating uh, end of the the ribbons, and that going to have important uh, physical consequences. Uh, in fact, one could, for say, for the armchair graphene nanoribbons, you could completely characterize, uh, uh, work out what this C2 invariance is, depending on uh, whether what kind of end the, the ribbon has and how many uh, layer uh, or carbon atoms that forms uh, the ribbon. I won't go into the details here, but one important consequence is the following. Suppose I look at a junction between two such uh, ribbons, say a, a ribbon with nine rows of common atoms, a ribbon with seven rows of common atoms. If you join them together like this, here's the interface, then you can work out what Z2 is for uh, this side and that side. In this geometry, C, uh, Z2 is equal to 1 on both sides. So they are topologically uh, the same, equivalent. And the theory said that there should not be any interface states. On the other hand, if I take this uh, right-hand segment and just move it up by one uh, uh, row and join them symmetrically like that, then Z2 on the left didn't cha doesn't change, it's equal to 1, but on the right, it's equal to 0. And that says that you have uh, a junction of topologically invariant objects, uh, and that should give you an interface state, a topologically protected interface state. Indeed, this is a plot of uh, such calculated interface state. And um, this should have some interesting uh, physics associated with it. I will come back to that later. Uh, now, what, what if I look at a single isolated ribbon? Then if you look at the end, then it's the, 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 the junction between the vacuum and the ribbon. The vacuum has a, is a, a trivial uh, topological uh, phase, Z2 is equal to zero, but inside, Z2 is actually equal to 1, so that you expect there to be an a, a end state here. And indeed, uh, you look into the literature, you will find that people actually have seen this end states. These are some STM images of the end of exactly this 7 armchair graphene nanoribbon. So you see that the, this is the end state and this is the end state. Uh, although the people have not interpreted in terms of this kind of topological phases. Uh, one could also change the topology of the electronic state by introducing uh, dopants. Here is a, a junction of, uh, of pristine graphene nanoribbon, and this is one with the dimer, a boron dimer dope case. That's a case that actually people are make already, I saw it earlier. And, and because you, the dopants introduce defect bands in the system, it actually changes the, the, the invariant C2 to, to zero, and that gives rise to uh, 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 interface state. And this interface state, again, is of topological origin, so it's protected. And it turns out that you have a periodic junction of this kind, then it would, uh, those uh, uh, interface state uh, would, uh, would be uh, robust spin centers. Uh, they are coupled antiferromagnetically. So that's very interesting because now you make, could make a super lattice of this, then you would have a, a, a quantum spin one-half chain with uh, tunable uh, nearest neighbor 
uh, coupling strength. Um, together with the experimentalists, we actually tried to build such a super lattice. Uh, at this point, we are uh, trying to make a seven, nine uh, uh, periodic array of such uh, super lattice. So as I mentioned, for a seven, nine junction of this symmetric geometry, that should be an interface state. So you put them uh, together to form a super lattice, then you should expect to have interface state here, interface state there. Um, the ninth ribbon actually has a uh, smaller gap than a seven ribbon, so the, the interface state actually decays more into the ninth uh, ribbon. So if you look at a super lattice like that, then you would see that the, the interface states should interact. They would interact stronger here than through this ribbon. So let me ex denote this as interaction as T1, this interaction as T2. Then you would expect the junction states, which are topologically protected, very stable to form two bands within the bulk band gap of your uh, ribbon. Uh, in fact, that's what you see. Uh, theoretically, you do the calculation. This would be the bulk gap, and these two bands come from uh, the topological uh, states. And in terms of the coupling strength, you could work out that uh, the, 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 the energy dispersion should look uh, something like this. That's a detail. But the important thing to know is that um, the, the, the energy position and uh, the dispersion depends on the coupling strain T1 and T2. So that means now you have a very stable system that you could change the band gap and the bandwidth of these topological states by just changing the, the, the length of the segment. And you would expect that um, the system to be magnetic if the the so-called uh, energy on-site U Coulomb energy, that is the energy to put extra electron on this, uh, the, the state uh, to be bigger than the, the gap. So you would expect that this system, when you turn it right, would be a magnetic system. And in fact, our colleague at Berkeley, uh, Felix Fisher and Mike Cromie, has made such a ribbon. This is a STM image of such a ribbon. You see that you have the, the seven segment here and the nine uh, segment over there. And they had done the STS, scanning tunneling spectroscopy measurement of the electronic density states. And this is our theoretical prediction. These are the two topological bands. And uh, these are the images of those uh, states. And here is the uh, uh, measure uh, uh, data. It has very good agreement both in terms of the position of the states and the, the, the character of the states. And this uh, result just came out two weeks ago. <laughs> so it's very new. Uh, now, let me talk about a, a Another thing related to band topology, uh, this is another thing that we just uh, recently found. What we found is that non-trivial topology, uh, band topology in two-dimensional system can dramatically change the optical selection rules in the photophysics of uh, 2D material. So let me begin with uh, uh, what is the conventional optical selection rule for exciting exciton? Uh, you can look that up in a semiconductor book or in a, a standard solid state book. What you would find is that for dipole allow systems, such as Galley mass night, then the optically active excitons are S like, and for dipole forbidden uh, semiconductors like cuprous oxide, then the optical, uh, optically active excitonic states are p-light. And that has something to do with, uh, uh, just like in the atomic physics, delta L has to be equal to uh, 1. But what we find is that that's not true in 2D 
uh, crystals because of a topological uh, effect. I will try to illustrate this with uh, the case of the electronic property of few layer uh, graphene. Uh, graphene has no gap, uh, but if you put it on top of uh, boron nitride, you break the, the two sub lattice symmetry of graphene. Again, this is a detail, uh, but it, it gives you a gap. Uh, for the states at the corner of the Brion zone. Uh, for bilayer graphene, if you apply electric field to it, you also could open up a gap. In fact, that gap depends on its, the, the strength for the, the, the electric field perpendicular to the layer. So you actually have a tunable gap. And that's the same with uh, trilayer graphene. However, the, the states uh, near the band edges for this system, in fact, are multi-component uh, states, that is, states composed of uh, many uh, uh, atomic orbitals. So you think of those uh, wave function, the components as a component of a spinner, then, then you, you, what you see is that spinner would actually winds around the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. It is this winding of the wave function that going to lead to a uh, non-zero winding number or a topological invariance that would change the optical selection rule of the material. So let me uh, illustrate this by uh, showing you a couple of equations. Uh, the optical transition for uh, exciton can be written in this form where this A coefficient is just related to the exciton wave function, and then this matrix element is the interband transition matrix elements. And um, you could think in terms of either putting in a right circular or left circular polarized light, then this matrix element are just complex uh, numbers in two dimension. Now, complex number in two dimensions, you could think of uh, it has an amplitude and a phase, so it's like a vector, so it forms a vector field. When you have a vector field in two dimensions, you could have a possibility of actually this field uh, has a critical point and has a winding number associated with it. And that's related to the so-called Ponderé uh, critical points and indices in uh, differential uh, geometry. And it's this winding number going to come into the selection rule. What we have proved is that um, instead of the old selection rules, that the new selection rules for uh, 2D semiconductor is that the optical transition strain will be zero unless the quantum number associated with the angular momentum of the exciton is equal to minus times that of the winding number of the, the dipole matrix element. So if I come back to my free example of uh, monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene, and trilayer graphene, what you see is that this uh, right circular and left circular polarized uh, the transition matrix elements, in fact, can have winding number equal to 2, minus 2, 1, or 2. So that means that even though graphene, the, all this system, are uh, dipole allow interband transition systems, uh, uh, this new selection rule said that for monolayer graphene or boron nitride, S excitons are active. But for bilayer graphene in the electric field, uh, P excitons are active, and, and S is very weak. And then for trilayer uh, uh, graphene, it, it's actually the P and D uh, exciton are uh, uh, active. So indeed, if you do the full calculation using many body theory for map initial, then what you get is a result like this, which uh, completely agree with this uh, analytic conceptual analysis. 
And what's even more interesting is that, say, for the bilayer graphene case, you excite the electron, uh, the exciton with right circular light. The prediction is that the luminescence would actually give you left polarized uh, light, unless, unlike the case of uh, conventional uh, semiconductors. And this prediction of having bright P like excitons and very weak uh, S like exciton have indeed been uh, confirmed experimentally. This is some work that we did together with Paul McEwen's group at Cornell. Or what they did is look at uh, photo current measurements on bilayer graphene with different uh, magnitude of electric field applied to it. So uh, you see this is uh, for small field, medium field, and high field. What they see is two peak, one correspond to a 2p exciton, and one correspond to the 1s uh, exciton. So the S states are very weakly bond, uh, we were very weakly active, but the P states are very very active uh, optically. And this is our full calculation. So indeed, there are very good quantitative agreement between uh, theory and experiment. So this is very exciting because now you have very strong tunable optical resonance with high quality factors. And, and that could lead to uh, possible applications in terms of tunable infrared detectors, light emitting dial and laser and so on. So uh, my collaborators are very excited about these possibilities. Uh, let me uh, skip this because it's kind of, uh, uh, but let, let me just say one thing. You can learn a lot about physical system by looking at mathematics. It turns out that there are a lot of uh, differential topology results on two-dimensional manifolds. And uh, for example, there's, there's a, a, a theorem called uh, Poincaré-Hoff theorem, which says the sum of the, uh, the, the Poincaré index of a compact uh, object uh, should equal to the so-called Euler's characteristics. So those indices are just the winding number I'm talking about. And because the two-dimensional Brion zone is a torus, two torus, the characteristic, Euler characteristic is zero. So that means that the sum of the winding number has to equal to zero. So that means if you have a two-valley uh, semiconductor, the winding number one has to equal to winding number the opposite. So um, so that's why the gaps, graphene systems, and the two-dimensional uh, transition metal dichotogenized must have the, va the, 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 the winding number of the k valley uh, equal to opposite of the uh, k prime valley. And to look for this kind of topological effects, one should really look at uh, multi-valley uh, semiconductors because if you only have uh, you have a semiconductor with only one gap, then the winding numbers by def uh, by this theorem has to equal to uh, zero. Uh, now I think I'm uh, kind of running out of time, so let me just mention one more thing and then I will stop. Uh, this is uh, magnetism, magnetism in two in atomically thin quasi 2D system. So far we, we have looked at optics and electronics. How about magnetism? Can we realize that? What is the physics in, involved and can, we, or, uh, and can we control it? Uh, so in collaboration with my colleagues at Berkeley and also Irvine and Princeton, we have looked at this uh, particular uh, system, chromium germanium terrarium, which is a uh, a ferromagnet in the bulk, and we want to see whether uh, uh, magnetism persists all the way down to a few, uh, minor la few layers. Now, there's a very the, why is this interesting? This is interesting because there's a very famous uh, theorem called Mermin-Wagner uh, theorem, which states that 
there is no ferromagnetism or anti-ferromagnetism in one or two uh, dimensional material in which the spins or the magnetic moments intact isotropically. Uh, so, and the reason, physical reason for that is because thermal fluctuation is in hand, fluctuations are in hand in low dimension, that would dis destroy magnetic order at any temperature. And in order to have um, magnetism, you have to have some kind of anisotropy in the interaction. So what we find is basically the following. I'm going to skip the detail and just so the calculated transition temperature as a function of layer versus the experimentally measured transition temperature using uh, a scanning magneto-optical curve uh, microscopy. So what you see is I indeed uh, the transition temperature actually decreased quite sharply with decreasing number of uh, layer that's related to this fluctuation I talk about. And it is still exists all the way down to on one layer uh, from in theory and our calculation uh, exists in to two layer uh, in the experiment. Uh, experimentalists could not get down to one layer because uh, for some reason it just disintegrates after a few minutes uh, when they try to make a monolayer. So the long range order does exist, so there's some anisotropy in the, in, in the interaction and we know where that comes from from our calculation. What we really discover, uh, we got excited about, is that really large tunability of this transition temperature when we apply a uh, uh, magnetic field to the system. The reason for that is that the transition temperature for magnetic transition in three dimension is basically dictated by the exchange interaction between the spins. And uh, that's typically very large in the order of a few hundred teslas. But magnetism in two dimension, as I mentioned, come from an isotropy. And I'm sorry, an isotropy usually come from spin orbit interaction that tend to be small. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, that is uh, in the order of uh, uh, fraction of the te uh, Tesla. So you apply a small magnetic field to the system, you could actually enhance the anisotropy. And that's what we find. Uh, that is, if you do the calculation and, and, and do the experiment, then what you find is the following. Let's focus on this six layer uh, sample. What you see is that if you uh, put in a fraction of a Tesla a magnetic field, you could actually incre increase the transition temperature by orders of magnitude. And, ex and this is our theoretical uh, calculation. So this is, again, very exciting because now you have an external knob to turn to change the magnetism in your uh, material. Uh, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to spit, uh, skip the last topic. You're interested, you could uh, uh, ask me about it. Uh, basically, what, what we saw in here is a very weird transport property of uh, electron in uh, graphene. If you put in a random potential, you actually have a phenomenon of supercollimation, that is, an uh, electron wave packet does not spread but actually remain uh, exactly the same shape, but guided by the fluctuating uh, potential. But I won't have time to talk about this. So let me summarize the, um, the talk with some take-home matrices. I hope I have um, convinced you that atomically thin 2D crystal are different, and they are potentially very useful. They have novel properties that can be tuned by substrate and gating. Does enhance electron electron interaction. Ex environmental screening is central, and graphene nanoribbons, in particular, are 1D topological has topological phases that may be manipulated for science and technology. There are new optical selection rules in 2D. 
uh, in particular for system with topological bands. Uh, intrinsic magnetism does exist down to a minor layer, and they are highly uh, tunable. And then, of course, there are many other interesting science and application of 2D uh, material that I don't have time uh, to touch on. So, uh, as a very last slide, let me just acknowledge all my uh, collaborators. The work I show you are all done uh, by my outstanding uh, students and postdocs at Berkeley. And these are my uh, senior uh, collaborators, uh, all of them are experimentalists. And I would like to thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, description of these intriguing uh, phenomena that you uh, find in 2D materials. I think we have time for a couple of uh, questions, if you have some. I think this is a microphone that can be thrown around. You mentioned some of the technological uh, possibilities in this. Where are some of the you know, the first ones that you imagine will be, will be uh, come in, in actual use? Well, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, optoelectronics, after, after there could be very interesting applications because both of uh, the strong excitonic effects and uh, the circular dichroism effects that you could uh, uh, make use of. Now, um, just like graphene, uh, people could think of all kinds of possible applications, but uh, to make it really into the industry is uh, quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hey, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a question regarding these uh, topologically uh, protected stays in, in graphene ribbons. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm no expert in topology. Uh, I was wondering, um, these states that are topologically protected, do, they, do you just find them by normal type binding or DFT calculations and the topology framework just provides sort of a new insight or are they completely new by including some, some topologically uh, inside? Uh, if you do a brute force calculation, it would always appear. Yeah, right? okay. Uh, so the, the topological um, analysis give you new insight where they come from, and you would, uh, you, you know they are protected. So by adding atoms to it or changing things a little bit should not destroy those uh, states. Um, so uh, this, uh, just like any quantity in topology, the fact that you find it means that it stays there no matter what, or how you distort or deform it uh, by a little bit. Thank you. Questions? Was one up there? Yeah, okay. The hand disappeared again. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Well, no more questions? Okay, then I think we'll just. Uh, uh, turn, you have what? Yes. Good. Did you? I have a, a comment for you, not a question. Uh, in the low end of, of your lecture, in the beginning, you, you uh, have told us about molybdenum and disulfide. Yes. It has a large greasing effect, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, bearing balls situation. Mm -hmm. Greasing effect is, is absolutely uh, large. And it's, it's in fact, uh, two-dimensional. Right. So the layers are very, very weakly yeah, intact. Yes. So maybe you have explained the, how, uh, how, how this effect 
I, I, I see a kind of, uh, I have to think about it, but I see a kind of explanation. Well, I think the explanation is that uh, each layer forms kind of a closed shell, electronic uh, closed shell sh system, and then the two layers uh, interact very weakly, so that's why they could slide very easily from one to another. Okay, it's just that, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank Stephen Louis again. Thank you.